Hey guys, so, you know, okay, this is a Lee upload of sorts. It's a Lee upload from Guardbeard, yeah. You know, look, you guys know Garbro. You know, he's done Stranded in Fantasy, he's done like, quite a few voiceovers first on this channel. Um, he's also done in the Guardbeardia Beardio uh, channel, and he's got this Veil Lighter series, which is actually really cool. You need to check it out. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I'm Lee uploading part one of his series. He's got five out of the minute, I believe. And, like, it's just something to, like, check out. I want to try and, like, you know, try and shine more of a light on the series. Because I think it's actually really good. The problem is, Garbu lights this himself. And it takes up a lot of his time to actually light it and then record it and whatnot. So I'm just going to try and, like, you know, try and show more people the story. Does that make any sense? So, like, I'm sorry this is an upload. If any of you guys have already seen it, you know, like... What can I say? Sorry about that. But for you guys that haven't seen it, I really hope you guys enjoy it because I think it's really cool, you know, and I really want to see more of it, you know. So this is more for my sake than anything else because I quite enjoy this series, but I don't want to spoil anything for you. So, like, sit back, enjoy. Let's get into this, will we? Chapter 1 of The Veil vale Riders Auf die Heide bloomt ein kleines Blum Shut the fuck up, dregs. A raucous rattle of laughter echoed up and down the cave tunnel the formation of men were marching down, the voices bouncing off the walls and wrapping around them as if the mountain itself was laughing with them. At the head of the formation was Tom Yule, a large man at six foot and heavily haired. A braided beard ran down his chin and shaggy curling locks falling outside of his ball cap. And the man he was speaking to was Dakota Dregs, a wiry man that grinned at Yule cheekily. Dregs was from New York, Yule from Oklahoma, and almost all of the states of America were represented as the 75 men and women walked into the darkness, their flashlights casting shadows on the damp rocky walls. You see, the hills of the Appalachian Mountains were always steeped in rumor and mysticism. Speaking of people going missing, miners that mined so deep they were never seen again, and weird shadows that stalked the forests. Children spoke of whispers amongst the bushes, glittering lights deep in the woods, but it was rare that a child was actually dumb enough to actually chase the sparkles in the deep. Until one was. Little Emily McCallan was the one child to throw the world into chaos and bridge the gap between fantasy and reality, dragging the whole of humanity in with her to the realm in between. It started out with a simple missing person report, a trail being tracked by a pair of search dogs, Roscoe and Rosie, both very good dogs who deserve many treats for their hard work, and it all leading up to a wide-mouthed cave. History of the cave was brief. Do not enter. A pair of explorers were hooked to drag lines and slowly entered the cave with their lights and began calling out for little Emily. After an hour, the line suddenly tightened and went slack. The team on the outside began to truly panic when, in winding back the drag lines, they found the line severed so neatly it was almost as if a giant scissor had come down and chopped the line right in half. Their radios were silent. The only thing greeting them was a static on the other end. A few of the team actually ran into the cave, going as far as they dare, and stopped right where the footprints of those who went before abruptly terminated. Their hair stood on end, rippling up and down their body as they stared into the impossible black. A darkness so deep and intense that not even their LED flashlights could even pierce the murk that ran along the walls. By the time they emerged from the cave opening, they were drenched in sweat and covered in small wounds from colliding with the walls during their escape. No matter who they sent in, whether it was human, animal, or robot, nothing ever came back from the veil, as some began to call it. Research came to a hard halt when a pair of college scientists were able to somehow receive and understand a signal from the veil itself, translating it after much sweating of the brow. In their words, they threw as much shit as they could at the walls, and the things that stuck were being worked into their system of translating whatever it was that was coming through. What they got through was just a language they could not understand, in which anyone who studied languages and alien dialects creamed their shorts and began to tear apart. 
It turned out to be a combination of ancient Celt and some version of Welsh, which made a lot of people's ears perk up, and the entire world waited to see what the team would put out. Finally, one day the words came. Break the veil. There was much smugness from the people who coined the name first. And enter where your ancients walked. Take with you the volcanic glass, bind yourself, and come see the world of dreams. The smarty boys who translated the scrabbled signals realized what the other bit of extra signal they had was, and working with the linguists, figured out what this bind yourself stuff was. It was a return code of sorts, which they assumed would need to be etched into obsidian, a fragile volcanic glass that would cut the shit out of you with little issue. The government, who was paying for all of this shit, was suddenly in the business of rock collecting, paying top dollar for any chunk of obsidian they get their hands on. The other countries are almost ready to fucking invade, it seemed like. All of them jockeying to try and hem the United States into letting their own assets join. But the president, a very prideful man at the time, wasn't going to let them on American soil. This cave, our cave, it's a very nice cave, and I only want Americans going inside that cave. You could say it's cave closed and letting others in, okay? Okay. There were small tests done in using the obsidian markers, and their findings of what they found on either side and its possibilities made the United States suddenly very protective of its new little nest egg for resources. When news was finally leaked, it did not sit well with the other countries in the slightest, and suddenly the American border was bristling with military hardware all the way around every single edge the United States had. For the first time in history, America was pointing her guns in every direction at once. This did, however, lead to a manpower problem. A problem of who would delve inside the veil and be disposable at the same time, and could be easily replaced. The American government and its military advisors pleaded their case, stating that the country needed them and that they had invested money and training into their more professional soldiers. Ideas were thrown around, until a bright idea came from the other branches of the Army and the Marines, both of the advisors having been leaning towards each other and talking the entire time. A light bulb had gone off in their heads, and they brought forth their combined efforts. What about militia? There were more veterans and militarily inclined people in the general population than there were actual active military from all the branches combined. A lot of them already had the training, and some of them even had their own gear and weapons. A little bit of funny money thrown at them, and perhaps they could be the well-armed guinea pigs who established a foothold on this new world. Well, sure was a good thing this was America doing this then, wasn't it? Word spread from around the internet that they were looking for a few good citizens who were willing to go into the unknown and explore a realm unknown to all. However, most of the professional mercenary companies were looking more to capitalize on the soon-to-come war they could all smell stinking on the wind. And others were too afraid to risk getting gored open by some mythical beast, or risk leaving the light of God and never going to heaven. Okay, Boomer. There were, however, those who dreamed of seeing a land of the fantastical and killing whatever lived there, if it was hostile. Yes, those brave volunteers of the militia were down for a little cave diving, and the pay was good enough to boot as well. It was money so good that it was almost irresistible when linked with the experience of actually being able to do some spooky cave shit for once. It would be worth noting that, indeed, a lot of the volunteers for this expedition were more or less garnered from the internet. I mean, what's more disposable than a bunch of veterans and militia members that wanted to crack at shooting a dragon with a 240 Bravo, or blowing a griffin out of the sky with an M3 Carl Gustav? The government was more than happy to sign off on the equipment, cut the checks, and sent the merry men and women of the Veil Walkers on their way. Their unit patch being a gun-toting unicorn wearing aviators. Their gear was a scattered collection of many different countries and military surplus. Some going as far as to only take the IOTV offered by the U.S. military. To say the Veil Walkers were a walking military surplus store would be an understatement. When it came to weapons, indeed the U.S. military offered their best for the Veil Walkers which was mostly Gulf War leftovers and a bunch of rattly M9s. Yule took one of those M9s, calling it an old friend he could always travel with. A lot of the poor and less well-equipped Veilwalkers took the M4s, M16s, and such quite readily, 
while the others use their preferred weapon from their own armory. One of those Veil Walkers, another veteran that went by Savage, spoke up in the darkness. Anyone else wondering why they gave us the old ACU pattern shit? you think they'd at least give us a Marpat to wear. Why would they waste Marpat on a bunch of dead men? Quip the unit's co-commander, an army veteran that went by Coco. The cave once again filled with laughter, while Yule chewed idly on a large corn cob pipe in his mouth and panned his flashlight from side to side, looking for the veil to pop up. His Daewoo K2 rattled slightly as he stopped, and Coco held up his fist. The formation of veil walkers came to a halt as the two commanders peered ahead into the void, swirling almost as if it was mist. They weren't kidding, murmured Yule, pushing his pipe to the side of his mouth with a slight knock of his teeth. Damn thing chews up all the light. Just supposed to walk into this fucking thing? Yeah, sounds like bullshit to me too, but it's what we signed up for, Coco replied, eagerly hooking his thumbs into his chest rig. Well, I'm glad we dressed up for the occasion, chuckled Yule, and the two men looked at each other's tropical-themed button-ups. That's a big cave. For you. There was more tittering behind them, as jokes were traded back and forth amongst the other Veil Walkers. Marker check! Yule barked out, the report echoing down the cave as everyone held off their fragile obsidian recall markers. One for the money, Yule whispers, stepping forward. Coco breathed out harshly, matching step with Yule. Two for the show. Three to make ready. Yule answered back as his arm entered the inky blackness, his flesh suddenly going numb, as if he was getting instant frostbite. Here we fucking go! roared Dregs, and one by one, the Veil Walkers entered the unknown. After the shockingly cold, brutal transition of the Veil, the cool dampness of the cave on the other side was almost stifling. Ah, fuck me! roared Yule, shaking his arms and legs to get the feeling back into them. Coco crashed into his back from behind and sent him flying forwards, scrabbling at the walls of the cave as his legs fought to remain as jelly and unyielding to his commands. Coco's feelings on the matter were similar. What the fuck, man? His voice echoed up and down with yules as he clamped at his ears, rubbing at them painfully as his feet stamped at the ground. Around the same reaction was shared with all the veil walkers as they exited the veil some of them falling temporarily unconscious as they hit the warm air and a system not knowing how to handle what the hell was going on. After the chorus of screams was finally over, Yule and Coco checked over all of their veil walkers and then moved back towards the veil entrance. There was a pause and then four crates appeared, just the flat facings of them. At least they keep their word, I suppose, Yule thought, and they began yanking the crates all the way through the veil. These were the be their rations and survival gear, enough to keep them fed, watered, and warm until they were due to rendezvous back with the team on the other side. Everything was split up among the troopers as well as extra ammo distributed, just in case. The call to move out was ordered, and the Veil Walkers began their walk out of the cave. It smells different here, a voice echoed from the rear, and indeed it did smell different here. Older, yet somehow cleaner. Coco pawned the barrel of his F.A.L. down at the dirt of the cave path. Tracks. Heads on a swivel, people, Yule called out, and he himself looked down at the tracks. A set of small ones and two other sets of larger ones. These sets of tracks were different from the first arrival team, since they were older and not all in one place. Yule sniffed a little and ground his teeth onto the stem of his pipe. He told himself he would try and find that little girl's body if he could, but how the hell could he even promise that there would be a body to find? There was no telling what was near the outside of this tunnel. As quietly as they could, and rifles at the low ready, the Veil Walkers stepped along the path until they turned a corner, and a dusky skylight drifted down the sides of the jagged rock. Daylight. Boys, we're near the exit. I want those weapons on fire, if you got a giggle switch, get it chuckling. Gonna get me enough, babe, just you wait, Toby, was heard from behind. There was a wave of clicks as all the weapons went hot as word was passed down. A heavy weapons team racked their cruisers, locking into place the bolts of multiple M249s, 240 Bravos, and the meaty chunk of a single M2 that they all agreed should be named Black Betty, Bama Lamb. They had her and her tripod ready to deploy, being carried by the both of them. 
The army almost didn't part with the M2, but the question of what if there's a fucking dragon was enough to let them borrow an older model. Black Betty's date and number marked her as an ancient Korean war model that was a warehouse queen, and after dusting her off, spraying her down with enough whale sperm to drown a small child, and giving her a good wipe up, she was alright enough to mow down unicorns and elves. The formation crept forward right to the mouth of the cave. The soft, warm air of an unknown morning caressed the faces of Coco and Yule. As planned, Yule said, poking his ball-capped head around the edge of the cave lip. Yeah, as planned, Coco affirmed, his trigger finger trembling just as hard as Yule's was. As a matter of fact, the entire cave sounded as if a bunch of bats were very cold and their teeth were chittering from how hard everyone was trembling. Go! Coco roared as Yule raised up his Daewoo and launched forward, the two of them rushing out of the cave in split directions. The rest of the unit poured out of the cave entrance like a horde of ants that got wind of a cherry lollipop, running the number of steps they were told to. Each member of the unit bounded forward to set up a quick cascading line of fire to cover any direction, like a giant U-shape in the mouth of the cave, as the crew serfs ran out and set up on whatever high ground they could find, mostly being the edges of the cave and its connected hill. The only thing that greeted them, as they all deployed out in formation, was the morning wind. The air was clean and crisp, warm and inviting, as if it was an old friend, welcoming them back from a long journey. The sun was rising from the horizon so vividly colored that many of the veil walkers had trouble yanking their eyes from it. A few camera clicks from cell phones were heard. Someone was going to get a smack for that. A few minutes passed as everyone stared out around them. The area was free of any buildings or any unnatural structures, with only a few clusters of trees nearby and other larger hills in the distance. A rather long tree line could be seen in the distance, and a veil walker who took care of hummingbirds back home took note the birds that flew around them overhead and in the distance were very similar to the ones they had seen through his years of bird care. Eyes peered through sights, and gun barrels swung back and forth slowly as everyone searched for targets. After a solid five minutes of silence, Yule and Coco waved at each other, signaling they saw nothing and got the lads in order. A female veil walker on one of the 240 Bravos cursed angrily and picked at a wedgie, growling to her female compatriot that the two of them wearing combat thongs was a stupid idea. As everyone stood up and looked around more intricately, a call went up from a sniper named Domino. Domino hopped from one foot to the other, his hands drumming on his M24 excitedly. Hey, hey, I think I found those, uh, fucking rescue guys. Coco and Yule shared a look before running over to see what he was on about. He had indeed found the lost rescue team, or what was left of them, anyway. So, look, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, if you want more of this, go down below, check the description. I've got the playlist set up. There's five parts. You can binge watch it all you want. You know, I think it's pretty good. And I really enjoy this. And, like, you know, I think if I really enjoy it, you guys will probably really enjoy it too. And it's more just a method for me to be able to get more of this because it takes up so much of Garbo's time to write and record and, you know, do all the bits to it that, you know, where he could be doing other stuff, he chooses to do this instead. And it really just isn't getting the views that really is needed to make it more viable you know what i mean to you know the amount of time invested into it i really enjoy his stuff you know you guys enjoy his stuff you guys have been listening to fucking the old skeleton party for ages we've done tons of those other stories you know you guys know him by this point you know and i i really enjoyed his rendition of stranded and fantasy i must say so like um if you want more Links down below. And remember to, you know, like Garbo when he uploads sporadically, so he does. He doesn't upload every day. So, you know, definitely remember to hit that bell notification, you know, just so you know when the parts are actually going to be up, you know, because you don't really know it can be like, is it going to be a Monday? Is it going to be a Tuesday? Is it going to be a Wednesday? You just don't know. But look, I hope you guys enjoyed this part and uh, stop listening to me about how good it is. You guys know, if you're listening to me at this point right now, you know how good it is. And actually, you don't because, like, you should be fucking clicking that playlist. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Like, anyway, look, I'm, you know how it is. All right. Um, sorry for the Lee upload in case any of you guys got excited, you know. But, look, check the playlist down below. I really hope you guys enjoy it and I'll see you tomorrow.